Due to the obvious failure of the Holy Roman Imperial model of government, I had intended to not um, revisit this topic. However, because studying the Holy Roman Empire gives such a stark relief to other forms of government in the late Middle Ages, I felt like it would be instructive to come back and talk about this monstrosity. In addition, I felt like it would also be good to explain how the Habsburg family arose and um, became the dominant political force in Europe um, in, you know, in the early modern period. And they have their origins in the Middle Ages, so I figured, hey, you know, maybe I'll revisit this topic after all. And besides, eventually I have to talk about the Reformation, and it would be kind of hard to understand how the Thirty Years' War and some of that kind of stuff happened without understanding just what a complete mess the Holy Roman Empire had become. So, therefore, I'm talking about the late medieval Holy Roman Empire. Please forgive me, but hopefully this will be somewhat interesting and instructive um, on some level. When I talked about the Holy Roman Empire in the past, I basically left it at they had some strong emperors here and there, and they were a major power in the Middle Ages, but over time, they fell into irrelevancy. Well, let's look at exactly how they fell into irrelevancy. So, one of their greatest emperors was Frederick II, but he died in 1250. And, you know, that wasn't as bad as it sounded. His son, Conrad IV, was able to take over, but he only lived for four years as emperor, and then he died in 1254. And then that created what is known as the Great Interregnum, which lasted from 1254 to 1273, in which there was no recognized legitimate emperor. Now, there were some various claimants to that title, but none of them were accepted and none of them were able to actually govern. So, it, during this 20-year span, what happens is that the various princes, meaning the semi-independent rulers who are subordinate to the Holy Roman Emperor, really gain in power, and they take away a lot of the prerogatives of the imperial throne that the throne will never recover, meaning that now we are in a much more diluted and decentralized state than before. Eventually, though, they decide that the title of Holy Roman Emperor is something that needs to be filled, so they elect Rudolf of Habsburg, um, who rules from 1273 to 1291, and this event ends the Great Interregnum. However, of course, um, Rudolf will have less power than Conrad IV, and he will never really recover the kind of authority that Conrad and um, his father Frederick had enjoyed. When he was elected as Holy Roman Emperor, Rudolf of Habsburg was not the biggest player in the game by any stretch of the imagination. And most of his estates were located in Switzerland, so he was on the periphery of the imperial world. But Rudolf had a lot of ambition, and he wanted to establish a hereditary monarchy that would be powerful enough that he could bypass the um, Holy Roman Imperial electoral system. And in the process, he also wanted to really enrich and empower his family so that they could control this electoral process. And surprisingly, even though he was coming from a relatively weak position vis-a-vis -vis most of the electors in his realm, he was able to do this, and the Habsburgs would win the election for Holy Roman Emperor for a few centuries in a row, actually. Anyway, um, the main power base that Rudolf would acquire, which would now become synonymous with the Habsburgs, would be Austria and particularly the part of Austria that the Habsburgs would rule from would be Vienna. And of course the Habsburg dynasty at Vienna would remain in place constantly all the way from when Rudolf established his seat there in the 13th century until the fall of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in 1918 following World War I. The rise of the Habsburgs really changed the political landscape of the Holy Roman Empire. And now there are two major factions in play in imperial politics for basically this entire period. You have the pro-Habsburg faction. This faction is based in the East and they are pro-French. They also favor a strong hereditary monarchy. I have to assume that much of their um, motive comes from the fact that they can be pro-French because they're not near France, so their borders will never be impinged upon. 
and they're in favor of a strong monarchy simply because they actually have threats on their border. Whereas the other faction is called the Princes or Opposition Faction, and that is based in the West on the French border. They're anti-French because, you know, they're, they're neighbors with them and they sometimes fight. And they are opposed to a strong hereditary monarchy because they tend to um, be more powerful lords who want to go their own way and have autonomy. And we'll see that this kind of general factionalism will also apply to Italy, a land which was once under the thumb of the empire. Due to the empire's loose structure and weak central power, there weren't really all that many government initiatives or major changes in policy. However, there was one major piece of legislation in 1356 which changed the face of the Holy Roman Empire significantly, and that is the Golden Bull of 1356. This was issued by the Emperor Charles IV, and it is part of his struggle with the Pope, and this is basically another struggle where the Pope is claiming the right to crown and approve of all of the emperors in the Holy Roman Empire. And of course, uh, not surprisingly, the emperors disagree with the Pope when it comes to what the source of their authority is. And while this was Charles standing up for his own prerogatives and those of the other Habsburgs, it actually ended up being a big victory for the princely or opposition faction. So, Charles decrees that imperial power is derived from God, and that the choice of the emperor by the electors is something which reflects the will of God and requires no confirmation by the Pope. So basically he's claiming the right, uh, he's claiming to be a God-appointed emperor while also not owing anything to the Pope. Um, this effectively further formalized the German electors, and now they would be set in stone for good. And now we have seven total electors in the empire. There are three ecclesiastical electors, the archbishops of Mainz, Trier, and Cologne, and it's pretty obvious why they're there, because um, they can use their authority as priests and um, bishops to offset the fact that the Pope has been excluded from this process. And then to emphasize the secular backing of his realm, um, Charles chose four secular princes. The Count Palatine of the Rhine, the Duke of Saxony, the Margrave of Brandenburg, and the King of Bohemia. And by the way, Brandenburg would later evolve into Prussia. Okay, so these electoral territories are now changed in terms of their inheritance laws and their territoriality because now they become indivisible and they become inherited by primogenitor, which is where the eldest son gets everything and the other sons don't inherit part of the realm. One way that they were able to do this is that um, what, what would happen is the younger sons could then um, take up an office somewhere and they could hold institutionalized authority without actually taking the realm itself. So that way the realm remains intact and the electors don't look ridiculous when, you know, the electorate has passed on to some really tiny, insignificant, hole-in-the-wall place. Now, um, another thing about the electors is that because they're so important to the realm, and because they make and break emperors, each of the seven is effectively sovereign in his own territory, and doesn't really have to answer to the emperor very often. So it might look like everything is peaches and cream if you're one of the Holy Roman princes. However, because of the tendency of the empire to have its power fragment into smaller and smaller portions, your power is going to be challenged by your own nobles, knights, etc. And your princely power will be diluted within your own realm, just like you are diluting the power of the emperor. So, one X factor here is that there are administrative officials in the empire called ministeriales, and they are a consistent threat to political unity throughout the 14th century because they have a tendency to do what they want due to a lack of accountability. Now, if you're a prince, let's return to this idea, you have to actually um, have the approval of pretty much everybody under your command to effectively levy taxes.
So you have to have the nobles, the knights. Um, the nobles have to basically approve. The knights have to enforce. The clergy have to agree to not, you know, denounce you. And the towns have to pay up because if they refuse, they usually have enough defenses to resist paying taxes. So you have to get all of these factions on board in order to raise taxes to, say, wage a war or do a grand building project. And because these orders have such a high degree of negotiating power, frequently what happens is that when the prince wants to raise money for a special project, he has to make permanent political concessions in exchange for a temporary influx of money, which means that over time his ability to govern is diminished to the point where he becomes less and less effective over a discourse of a few centuries. Let's talk about the post-1400 empire, and I use empire in scare quotes because it is sort of a stretch to even call it an empire at this point. Now before, when we had strong emperors like Frederick II, he could actually exert force beyond his own borders, and he could govern even if there were some limits on his power. But by 1400, the power of the emperors had slipped to the point where calling it an empire is almost a misnomer. Maybe we can call it like the big conglomeration of confusing and um, ineffective arrangements. How about that? Anyway, um, so by after around 1400 or so, non-elector princes began to see that their own realms were getting fragmented greatly and that eventually only the electors would have any power at all. So what they did is they also tried to adopt indivisibility within their own realms to retain the coherency and power of each little state. They did this with varying degrees of success, obviously, as we remember from uh, when Napoleon found the Holy Roman Empire and it was divided into hundreds of little states and it was just an incoherent mess. But one thing that they could do to um, appease extra sons who were not going to inherit was to give them various offices that were created, like chancellor or what have you. And um, eventually what happens is that the larger of these petty states gain enough um, autonomy and um, coherence within themselves to develop their own independent coinage and administration. And at first that seems like a good idea, but later on this will be another thing that confuses outsiders and you know really makes the whole thing look like a mess. So another thing that will really limit the ability of the emperor to do anything is that the electors are effectively sovereign princes who can do what they want. So you can't really order them around. So that's seven areas in your empire that you can't control really. And not to mention there are also free cities in the Holy Roman Empire as well. And if we remember back to talking about cities in the late Middle Ages, they are largely self-governing and they usually only cooperate when it's in their best interest or when they're compelled by a massively superior force. And if you're a Holy Roman Empire after 1400, then getting a big army is kind of hard. So um, this means that the imperial title doesn't really have a lot of political power anymore. And if you're a Habsburg Holy Roman Emperor, you're probably more um, concerned with your authority in Austria than you are with your official imperial title because your authority in Austria is much more meaningful. Um, however, this title still has a lot of symbolic value, so that's why the Habsburgs keep winning it over and over and over and keep hogging it. So, over time, what we see is that the Holy Roman Empire will lose land in the west, the French will advance their frontier at the expense of the empire, and around 1300 or so, not long after Rudolf of Habsburg becomes the emperor, um, Switzerland will manage to break away from the empire. So, now that we've looked at the empire, we're pretty well set up to look at functional governments, like the city-states of Italy or the national monarchies of England and France. So, let's go do that.